Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for the privilege to come before you today. We thank you for bringing us into yet another month, this month of May, and for keeping us throughout this week. We pray right now that as we gather in this place, both physically and wherever we may be participating, whether we're in our homes, in our living rooms, in our dining rooms, in our cars, outside enjoying the beautiful weather, whatever we're doing while we are participating in this service, we pray that you would meet us where you are, have your way, get the glory out of all that we do today, but we know that we can't do this without your presence. So we ask your presence to rest upon every place physically where we are and upon this broadcast so that wherever people are partaking in, whenever they watch, they will come to know more about you because you are truly the focus of this time. We, th we love you. We thank you for keeping us. And we pray that you would help us to be better representatives of you where you have placed us. These things we ask in your son, Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our service on this, the first Sunday in May. Um, it's just amazing that we're still here, you know. We're already on the first Sunday of the fifth month of the year of 2023. So I've said a version of this pretty much every Sunday, but this year is going by pretty quickly and slowly at the same time, if you get what I'm saying. But we are thankful to be here. And I say we because even though you typically only see me on Sundays, you know, First Lady and Baby Boy Sawyer are always lurking in the background. And then there's still the many other people who work behind the scenes to keep us afloat. And of course, they know who they are. But we are thankful to be here, thankful for your prayers, thankful for your kind words, thankful for your support of this ministry. You all are the ones that keep us afloat. As always, you know, we like to make sure people know how they can find us. Oh, let me take my name down. Um, but yeah, as always, we want people to know we're on Facebook, which presumably if you're watching us live, you know this. So we are on Facebook at Pivot Point Gathering. We're also on YouTube at Pivot Point Gathering. Just a minute. Um, we are on Instagram at underscore pivot underscore point. We are on Twitter at underscore pivot underscore point. And we are on TikTok at underscore pivot underscore point. So it's good to see you all. Um, apparently, I can't see my Facebook comments. So I know I usually interact with you all a lot more. Yeah, I usually interact with you all a lot more, but today I can't see comments for some reason. So in fact, I'm making sure that this service is even going out live. If you all can see me, looks like you all can see me, but like I said, I can't see your comments today, which is weird, but I will keep trying. And we are also at um, our website, pivotpoint.church. So I'm glad to see all of you. I know that some of you are watching. As I said, I'll keep checking to see if your comments will come back later. But right now, unlike how things usually are, I cannot see your comments today. But I'm thankful that you're here anyway. So, um, but I also usually use this as a time to encourage those in our um, circle. You know, if you're watching and you feel so led to do so, share this is how people find out that we exist um one of the benefits of the pandemic is that it made sure that so many of us have we would be able to have access to church in our homes you know a lot of churches were not streaming online before that but most are the disadvantage is that it no longer sets us apart so if you feel like people in your network could benefit from what we're doing i encourage you to share us right now in fact, I am sharing right now. Um, not that you all will see because presumably you all are watching, but I encourage you to share. If you're not the kind of person who likes to share, it's cool. I probably wouldn't share either where it's not, you know, my church. But I am very thankful to be here, and I'm very thankful that you all are here gathering with us. Um, again, I'm going to try these comments one more time. If they don't come in, then they just are probably not going to come in. Yeah, they're not going to come in today. I don't know how I can check my stream settings while I'm streaming, but, you know, things happen. So all this means is that we're going to have to improvise a bit when we get to our prayer requests. 
um, because like I've said, unfortunately, I cannot, well, actually, I can probably pull them up on my phone, but right now I can't see them. So, but um, I am glad to be here. Um, it's been quite a busy weekend. For those who didn't know, um, one of my cousins is getting married. Actually, he got married last night, but it's more or less um, his wife, well, my new cousin, she's Ghanaian, so they're having two ceremonies. So one ceremony was last night, and the next the other ceremony will be in a few weeks. But it just was great to come together and see family and friends, like, but mostly family that I hadn't seen in a while, and just talk with my cousins about how important, important it is for us to stick together and spend more time together in light of the fact that, you know, our parents are getting older. It's going to be up to us to keep the family together. So it was nice to be in that environment. And congratulations again to Matt and Oregua. I think I said her name right, but my new cousin. And you'll probably hear me congratulate them again in a few weeks because they're having their traditional American ceremony in June. But it just was great to spend time with family, get to meet my new extended family. And yeah, as one of my cousins and I were saying yesterday, it's, it's also nice to come together as family when it's not around a funeral or something. Because, you know, those are the main times family members could really come together. We come together at weddings. We come together at funerals and say that we need to come together more often. So it was nice to actually come together for something that wasn't sad. Um, and I encourage all of you, you know, if you're looking for a reason, just reach out to that loved one. Um, it really does make a difference. We were placed here not to be alone, but to be in community with one another. Scripture says that over and over again. So for many of us, you know, if you have family and your family is not toxic or detrimental to your health, you know, be thankful for that and spend time with them. You know, that's your built-in community that God has given you. And I'm also thankful for those of you who feel that Pivot Point Gathering is your community. We would, we are thankful for that. And that is one of our goals, to provide community to people who need it. We're going to be doing better with having more in-person and virtual events so that we can really interact with one another. But I'm thankful for each and every one of you today, even if I can't see your comments. Yep, they're not going to come through today. Okay, so moving on. Um... We are going to jump into our selections for today. Um, I've been feeling pretty passionate about old songs lately, so I'm just going to sing a verse of um, an old hymn that a lot of us grew up on if you grew up in a black Baptist church, and that is Yield Not to Temptation. But particularly, I just love the chorus of the song, Ask the Savior to help you, comfort and strengthen and keep you. He is willing to aid you. He will carry you through. And that ties into a lot of what my sermon is going to be about today. So I thought, thought I'll just sing the verse and I'll sing the chorus a few times so that we can get it. And yeah, then we will be back for announcements. All right. Oh, but speaking of which, just a reminder for those who don't know, this is our communion Sunday. So feel free to get your symbols of the body and blood of Christ together. I have mine together. And what we'll do is after the sermon, we are going to pray and dedicate those elements together, all right? And don't worry, there's still probably a way I can see your comments. I just have to improvise a bit. All right, but we're going to sing first, and then I'll see if the comments come back. If they don't come back, I'll just have to look at them on my phone, but I'll let you all know. Um, we may not be able to share the prayer request the way that we tend to, but um, I will promise to go back through the service afterward and pray over your prayer requests. All right. I think that's how we're going to have to do it today because, yeah, it's not easy for me to go on my phone and look for your prayer requests during service. So, but let's jump to the song, ask the Savior to help you. And who knows, maybe you all can pray and we'll see if God makes it possible for the comments to come back before the end of the service. All right.
yield not to temptation for yielding is sin each victory will help you some other to win fight manfully onward dark passion subdue look ever to Jesus he will carry you through why don't you ask the Savior to help you comfort, strengthen, and keep you. He is willing to aid you. He will carry you through. Let's sing the verse more time. Yield not to temptation for yielding. victory will help you some other to win fight manfully onward dark passions of do look ever to Jesus he will carry through. Why don't you ask the Savior to help you? Comfort, strength, and thank you. check to make sure the comments did not come back they are gone okay well it is good to see you all today I'm not going to stress myself about not seeing your comments but just know that what it means is that instead of me being able to share your prayer request during service today we I'm going to have to pray for any prayer request that's submitted afterward the good thing is that we do submit our prayer requests in multiple ways in this congregation you can submit them through your um, contact card. Actually, I didn't talk about contact cards yet today, so I'm going to talk about them now. If this is your first time worshiping with us, um, we would love to hear from you. So fill out the contact card. The link is available right here at the bottom of the screen and also in the description of today's service. So you can click there. Um, you know, we want to hear about you, how we can um, better serve you and what you need us to pray for. That's one way you can submit your prayer requests. You can also submit them usually through our comments today, like I've said. I unfortunately cannot see them right now, but I will be able to see them after service. So I'll pray for you there. Or you can submit your prayer request through our Facebook and Instagram stories, which are up. And we will pray for those after service. Usually we pray for the prayer requests that come in our comments during service. But like I said, for whatever reason, I can't see them today. So <laughs> we'll pray for those after. But um, if this is your first time, we'd love to hear from you. So 
you know, fill out a contact card if this is your first time worshiping with us. Um, I also would like to let you know how you can donate to support us. Um, you know, thankfully, because we are a largely virtual ministry, we don't have a lot of overhead. You know, we use the Internet that is at my house, so we're not paying for that. Um, and for the most part, our overhead consists of, you know, Zoom for when we have meetings and the tech that you see, you know, particularly this iPad belongs to the church. There are two more iPads that you you don't see them as iPads, but you see the different views on the cameras. They belong to the church. Um, the lovely keyboard I was playing a little earlier belongs to the church. Um, and we're going to be updating um, some more of our tech pretty soon. So if you want to know where your money would be going, if you donate to our ministry, that's where we'll be going. Um, also, though, just understanding that we are passionate about where we believe God will be taking us. We want to get to when we talk about things we are praying about. But one of those things we would like at some point is a physical location, you know, not just because it'll be great to get the church out of, you know, your pastor's basement, but also just because um, there are people who we are unable to reach right now because we're primarily existing in a virtual way. So those are the kinds of places where your money would be going. All right. And lastly, if you want more information about who we are as a ministry, feel free to reach out, check out our website at pivotpoint.church. That is pivotpoint.church. Now, I'm going to move on to our prayers, the things we are praying about. I kind of jumped the gun and talked about some of those things already, but we're going to go there right now. So I've already talked about the first one, which is our location. All right. As I've said, I feel like we do a good job talking about things as Pivot Point Gathering, but I do know that in order for us to be the ministry God has called us to be, we are going to need a physical location at some point. That's not saying that those of you who worship with us virtually, you know, will be able to, we you know, will be unable to continue. Like, no, we are going to continue with our great online offerings, but we still want to have a physical location for those people who are on the other side of the digital divide meaning maybe they don't have access to Wi-Fi because, you know, there is still a large contingent of our society that feels like Wi-Fi is more of a luxury, even though you really can't get by in our society right now without smartphone access or Wi-Fi in your house. But we know there are some people who just don't have access to the kind of social networks that we are available on, you know, being primarily Facebook and YouTube. So we want to make sure we can reach those people or people who are just uncomfortable with, you know, social media. And there's good reason for that. You know, some people find social media to be incredibly unhealthy, especially for people who are younger. So I get it. And then there are some who are senior citizens who don't really understand the technology, you know. So whatever the reason is that people can't find us, we want to make sure we're accessible to as many people as God puts it on our hearts to reach. So. That's one of the reasons that I feel it's very important for us to have a location. We can do a lot as a virtual ministry, but there's still some things that we need a brick and mortar building to do. And then when we talk about capacity. I mean, our ability to complete the vision that God has given us. Um, you know, some of you know our new tagline is breaking barriers and building bridges. That takes a lot of people. As much as I would like to do all of it on my own, I know that I can't. And that's actually a bit of a struggle for me sometimes. But I'm coming to acknowledge my own personal capacity and my limitations. But I know that in order for us as a ministry to be who God called us to be, there will be some more people that God will be sending our way, some financial resources God will be sending our way, some great ideas that God will be sending our way. So when I talk about capacity, that's what I mean our ability to do what it is God has called us to do. I also want to continue to pray about the violence that's happening in our streets. I mean, it feels like every week there is another um, mass shooting, the most recent one being at the Outlet Mall in suburban Dallas, Texas. We want to keep those families in prayer and also pray that there's some way that our particular ministry can have a role in um addressing the violence on our streets, whether that means, you know, writing letters to politicians, whether that means 
opening an after school program for at risk youth, whatever it is, I just pray that God will help us to see what our role is. What is it that's something that unique that us as Pivot Point Gathering are able to do? Then we want to talk about health. You know, our community, meaning the black community, we do have poor health care outcomes that are generally related to the kinds of bias that we face in the medical system. So we would like to continue to pray about the health of our community as well as to see what God would have us to do as a ministry to address this. We're going to also continue to pray for our bereaved families and for our political system in general as we are nearing closer and closer to that fiscal cliff, as we call it, and um, people are too busy playing politics than to actually, you know, do what needs to be done for the good of our country. So I want to pray for our political system in general, that God will raise up politicians who truly care, and not politicians who do what they're doing to make sure they maintain their power. So that is our prayer request. Well, our pr- corporate prayer requests. We know that some of you have already entered prayer requests in um, the comments. Like I've said, I will be checking those after service. We also have one more announcement I'd like to make. Um, so we are supporting the um, Maternity Care Coalition through a donation drive. And the donation drive, it started on April 23rd. It's going to go through May 14th, you know, Mother's Day next week. So we will have, you know, you will have a little bit more time to um, participate. But we're collecting items to support parents um, and young children in the greater Philadelphia area. Um, Particularly what we're collecting, it says on site, but really you would have to like um, organize a pickup time with us. If you're in the Philadelphia area, we're collecting diapers, wipes, and formula. Um, But you could also participate virtually by finding the Maternity Care Coalition's wish list. Um, And to do that, you see there's the QR code. Um, This is also available on our social media, particularly on our Facebook. It's not on our Instagram yet. I should put it on our Instagram soon. But for now, it's on our Facebook. It should be on our Instagram pretty soon. Um, We thank you for those who have already been contributing to this. But we really would love to make a difference. I mean, as the parent of a now 14-month-old, I know how important um, supplies are to your child's welfare, and it would just be a nightmare to any parent not to be able to afford the very things that your child needs in order to thrive. So I'm thankful to First Lady for finding this particular drive, and I'm really looking forward, well, I'm really hopeful to see just how much we are able to gather as a ministry. All right? And the last announcement I'd like to make is some of you missed um, the first um, 1619 project um, discussion that we had on the 29th. We're going to have another um, discussion that will be focused on the next two episodes, episodes three and four, which are about music and capitalism, respectively. That's going to happen on um, Saturday, June 10th making sure I have the date right. If I don't have the date right, I will correct it. But whatever that Saturday is, it's happening um, at 11 o'clock a.m. on Zoom. We are still asking for registration, though we are going to make it a little bit easier for people to get on this time because it was a very good discussion that we had. And we want to make sure that more people are actually able to partake in it. But we're going to be talking about music and capitalism as they relate to um, the African-American community. And for those who just need some background, the 1619 Project was a project of the um, New York Times. Um, It was released in 2019 at first in order to um, chronicle the 400 years that have taken place between the first enslaved Africans who who arrived at this country in 1619 and what were current events in 2019. Um, The latest iteration of it is available on Hulu, and it now comes up to early 2023. So, you know, you'll find some information about, like, um, when former President Trump 
um, incited that insurrection that we talked about. All those things are now a part of this. So it brings it up to pretty much the current day. And it's going to be great to see just how they chronicle the history of African Americans, our role in music, and also the way that slavery was informed by capitalism. And I'm looking at my calendar right now to make sure I had the right date for you. Um, yes, it is the right date. Okay, so that is June 10th. And let me bring the screen back. That is it. So we're going to move on to our um, word for today. All right. So if you can open your Bibles to Second Kings chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Again, that is Second Kings chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. And as I've said, I would usually be asking one of you to type through amen. You're still welcome to do that. I'll pretend that I see it and give you all a little bit more time because, as I've been saying, usually I can see your comments when I come through. They are not coming through today. So, but we will be reading from the New American Standard Bible, all right? 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. But like I said, I want to just personally greet all of you. Because, you know, some of you are used to me greeting you all every Sunday. And, like, I miss being able to say hi. The comments do make it feel like, in some ways, you're in this room with me. And so I definitely miss that. But I know you all are here. Just keep praying. Um, your prayers do keep us afloat. But, yes, um, 2 Kings 4, um, beginning at verse 1. I'm going to put it up on the screen right now so you all can see. Yeah, it's funny. One of the things that bothered me about this particular graphic of the Bible I put up is that it's clear that it's in the book of Psalms, but today's reference is um, 2 Kings chapter 4. All right. So we know that. But I like the idea of using graphics to help us understand what part of service we're up to. Oh, and I realize I usually put up a graphic for communion. I'll add that in later. But okay. Second Kings chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. And it reads thus. Now a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor has come to take my two children as, to be his slaves. Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. Then he said, go borrow vessels large for yourself from all your neighbors, even empty vessels. Do not get a few. And you shall go in and shut the door behind you and your sons and pour out into all these vessels and you shall set aside what is full. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons. They were bringing the vessels to her and she poured. When the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not one vessel more, and the oil stopped. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay your debt, and you and your sons can live on the rest. So today, if we're taking notes, the title of today's message is this. The importance of asking for help. That is, the importance of asking for help. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for being here with us. We thank you for the community that exists, for the love that exists in this place, and for the fellowship that exists here. And even now, um, as our members are sharing with one another on um, the comments, we just pray that you would have your way, that this would truly be a time that's about you. And as we come to this preaching moment, we ask that you would speak through me, use me for your glory, that when people see, hear, and experience you, they are truly hearing you directly through me. So move me aside. 
that people will truly hear everything you would have for them to hear, that you will help us to be better representatives where you have placed us. These things we ask in your son, Jesus' name, amen. So, the importance of asking for help. <clears throat> Just give me a second. I have to get the preaching iPad out. The importance of asking for help. As I prayed about what I was going to preach on today, um, I felt God pointing me to something that was pretty key, which is that this is a difficult time for a lot of us in society today right now. Um, for all intents and purposes, we are in the midst of another recession. I say for all intents and purposes because, you know, economists and politicians are disagreeing about what is happening, but we can feel what is happening and it is definitely hurting in a pretty big way. Um, we are experiencing, yeah, all the major impacts of an economic downturn, whether people want to acknowledge it or not. And uh, as I alluded to earlier, it's only going to get worse if our politicians in Congress can't find a way to come to an agreement about raising our debt limit. Because as you know, if we as a country, I'm talking about the United States, if we're unable to raise our debt limit, we will start to default on our debt, which will mean that the interest rates of the country's debt will go up, which will mean that our taxes will go up and the expenses around anything we're doing in this country will go up, which, of course, will hurt us even more in the long run. So that's what I'm getting at here. But on top of that, we know that in general, Things change as time progresses, and all of us feel the impact of time changing. The most obvious impact of time changing is aging. And I know I personally, you know, came to understand how much time had passed in my life when I went to my cousin's wedding and saw another one of my cousins, her two children, who are both teenagers now not even young teenagers but you know pretty mature looking teenagers and I remember them both being babies and in fact um at first lady and I's wedding a few years ago they were like young kids so yeah that's one of the impacts of time passing aging and for some of us realizing how much time has passed means realizing that we are not capable of doing things we could have done years ago I see a lot of my like counterparts joking on social media about feeling their knees and feeling their back and things like that. You know, things that when we were younger, you know, we could just kind of spring up. Maybe some of us could dance, you know, <laughs> get low or whatever and just kind of not care about it. And now some of us try to do some squats and it's like you need help getting up, like your knees buckle, things like that. So, you know. Yes, some of us have experienced things like that. And then for others, though, it means realizing that we are now in a position to inherit responsibilities that wouldn't have been ours even a year or so ago. Maybe that means watching over an aging parent. Maybe that means becoming a parent. You know, maybe that means, you know, getting a promotion at work. But in general, we find ourselves in positions where we are now given more responsibility and more authority because of maybe the time we have spent, maybe, you know, and some of that comes with age. So that's what I'm getting at. That with age comes responsibility, comes authority, and in some cases comes uh, diminishing in our physical prowess, if we will. Well, Today, God brought me to a passage that has a bit of both types of conditions that I have mentioned. It is the story of a woman whose husband has recently died. So, therefore, she ended up having to inherit some of his responsibilities. Um, the problem was that, in this instance, her husband, um, who was among the sons of the prophets, had debt. So, 
the story has a bit of the complexity that comes with things changing in time, you know, mixed with the reality and the practicality of debt, you know, financial difficulties. But what I appreciate about this passage is how this widow handles her situation. She is bold in reaching out to Elisha the prophet and asking for help. And that's something that for many of us, if we're honest with ourselves, we struggle there. So for the purposes of this sermon, we're going to talk about the importance of asking for help through looking at the story of this unnamed widow. And it's my hope that this message will help us, at least within our community, to reduce some of the stigma around being in need that causes us to struggle longer than we actually would need to if we were okay with asking for help. But before we get into that, um, just a bit of context. First, we're going to talk about Elisha, Elisha the prophet. Who was he? Well, the main prophet who's in this passage, he is the successor to the prophet Elijah. In fact, we see that he asked Elijah for a double portion of his anointing not too far before Elijah is taken up. And as such, Elisha is known as one of the most powerful prophets in the Old Testament. Now we're going to talk about um, the condition of being a widow. So in Old Testament society, in case you need a, um, a bit of a primer on this, um, a woman's life was largely defined by the men who were in it. <laughs> you figure a woman would grow up in the house of her father and then would leave the house of her father to go to the house of her husband. And if said woman were to outlive her husband, she would end up being the responsibility of <clears throat> other male relatives, and typically sons, sometimes the um, brothers of the husband or things like that. <clears throat> In fact, you all may remember some of this from the book of Ruth. We talk about Boaz, the man that Ruth ended up finding, you know, but Boaz was in the role of kinsman redeemer, meaning he was the closest male relative that could have assumed um, responsibility of Ruth after her husband and his brothers were killed in the war. So as you can understand now from the book of Ruth, we find that widows can really find themselves in pretty precarious positions if they are unable to find a man who will take care of them pretty quickly. And if they weren't young enough or desirable enough for marriage, like Ruth was, they could find themselves stuck living a life of poverty. After all, during this time, one of the most common ways that women were able to live if they were not you know, living in the house of their father or the house of their husband, they ended up becoming prostitutes because that was pretty much the only thing a single woman could do during that time <clears throat> and then the last piece of, co piece of context I want to say is I want to talk a little bit about the, um, the widow's husband being among the sons of prophets so this is generally interpreted that the husband was literally the son of a prophet which is something that is confusing to some of us because most of the prophets we hear about in the Old Testament we don't hear about them having families. In fact, it sounds as if they were unable to have families because the mission on their life prevented it. When I'm talking about something about people like Isaiah, Jeremiah, you know, we even talk about Daniel being a prophet, but Daniel was also quite likely a eunuch. So he couldn't have had children even if he wanted to. Um, but what this passage lets us know is that there were some prophets that were, in spite of their call, able to marry and have children. Um, and because they're referred to as the sons of the prophets, you know, as a group, it lets us know that these were people who were likely to band together, quite possibly because of the fact that they had a pretty unique upbringing. Think of it as the way that children of pastors today kind of come together. Nobody really understands their upbringing, you know, but each other. So it's like an affinity group, if you will. But the thing I want to make clear about this is that even though the widow, 
you know, her husband was among the sons of the prophets, being the child of a prophet did not mean that he had a prophetic call over his life. And I'm making that clear, um, you know, because we understand this, that um, the prophetic is not necessarily something that goes down bloodlines, um, just like being a priest doesn't necessarily go down bloodlines, you know. I mean, meaning, yes, in scripture, there were people, there was a particular tribe, the tribe of Levi, that was designated to be the priests. But we've also seen in places like, let's talk about the story of Samuel. Samuel was seen as Eli's successor when it came to the priesthood, but Eli's own children were not good priests. So, you know, in scripture, the prophetic went the same way in the sense that Elisha was Elijah's successor, you know, and Elijah didn't pick up his, you know, prophetic mantle from his father, you know, just like Elisha didn't pick it up from his father. So the thing I want to make clear is that being the child of a prophet didn't necessarily guarantee that a person would be a prophet, but what it did guarantee was, um, an increased level of familiarity in how things worked, you know, and how God worked and how the things of God worked. And we see that kind of thing today, even with say children of ministers have a better understanding of how church works than the average person would, whether those children are called to preach or not, that understanding, that familiarity does not go away. And I'm bringing this up because while we don't know if the widow's, husband was a prophet we do know that he had a lot of familiarity of how the prophets worked and that he seems to have passed that familiarity on to his wife based on the way she handles herself in this passage so now that we understand these things i want to jump right into the first point which is this we cannot be too ashamed to ask for help again we cannot be too ashamed to ask for help all right um so the widow she recognized her opportunity to ask for help when elijah the prophet i mean when elisha the prophet was within earshot of her she cried out to him about her situation recognizing that he was a mighty prophet of god after all you know because of her late husband being a son of a prophet, she was familiar with the way that prophets worked. And her husband probably was known to other prophets at that time as well. And the woman, as she talks to Elisha about her husband, she makes it clear that her husband feared the Lord. Yet, in spite of her husband fearing the Lord, he had a problem that many of us are still ashamed to talk about today, even though you know, statistically, the majority of us deal with it to some extent. He was in debt. And what is especially interesting about this passage is that there is no moral judgment placed upon him for being in debt. I say this because there are many people today who feel that having debt is always an indication of some sort of moral failing. You know, we tend to think, you're in debt because you're spending above your means and you're spending above your means because you're wasteful. Therefore, being wasteful makes you immoral. But this passage kind of pushes back against that because the passage makes it clear that the widow's husband was a man of God, a man of faith, a believer, a person who was God-fearing. And yet he had debt that ended up impacting his wife and kids upon his death. Now, of course, we know that today many of our negative assumptions, many of our negative assumptions that are associated with debt or in need in general, I'm going to start that again. So, of course, we know that today many of our negative assumptions that we have about debt or being in need in general come from our understanding of capitalism. You know, we feel like the only worth we have is what we are able to produce. And if we are not able to produce enough to adequately take care of those that, you know, we are responsible for, our loved ones, our families, our children, you know, we are likely 
to feel that we are deficient in some way instead of realizing that it's really the system itself that is deficient. But that is another story entirely. You know, but I will say that a lot of us struggle with the understanding that we are of intrinsic value, the understanding that we are deserving of dignity and respect, whether we are able to produce enough, you know, to take care of ourselves or not, just by being human, just by being children of God, just by being members of this society, just by being citizens of this world, we are of intrinsic value. When God created us, God created us because we were of value to him. And I have to say that because some of us have trouble separating our value as people from the amount of money in our bank accounts or from the kind of house we live in or from the kind of car we drive. And a lot of that is a reflection of the society that we live in, the capitalistic society that we think that people who, and this is unconscious for a lot of us, but we think that people who have a lot of money do so because they were moral and hardworking and that those who don't have as much were lazy. Even though if you've ever been around, you know, some of the people in our society who are the hardest workers are the ones whose jobs pay the least. Like I'm talking about our custodians. I'm talking about our supermarket workers. I'm talking about um, our trash collectors. You know, I'm talking about our, sweet, our street sweepers. You get the idea. These are people who work hard, long hours, and don't get a lot of money for it. And then you find that people in certain contexts who are multimillionaires or billionaires may be doing that because they just kind of inherited it. So all I'm saying is that um, in a lot of ways, capitalism is the reason that we associate immorality with being in debt instead of understanding that a lot of us are in debt because we live in a messed up system but that like i said is a whole other message entirely and i'm not trying to get to that we can talk about that another time but the fact that we need to understand is that we are living in a period of unprecedented inflation in our country and that our money doesn't go as far as it once did so it is sad when you think about how much pushback there has been against any kind of debt relief that would benefit the average person. And yes, I'm talking about, you know, trying to increase the minimum wage. There's been a pushback against that or trying to forgive the debt for a lot of people who, you know, went into debt trying to build better lives for themselves by going to college. And yet there's pushback against forgiving debt that was taken out to try to improve one's life and um so what i'm saying is that there is a lot of selfishness in our society and that truth be told it feels like sometimes the only people our society really wants to help are the wealthy billionaires and millionaires who probably don't need as much help as the rest of us but as i said i digress another message entirely the point here is that the widow in this passage knew that the debt that she had was going to lead to her children having to work it off as indentured servants. And she didn't want that to happen. So when the prophet Elisha was within an earshot of her, she cried out to him about what was happening in her life. And in that same way, we have to be okay with asking for help when we need it. We cannot be ashamed to do so. And I know that that can be a struggle. One thing that I've been working on in my personal life is being okay with asking for help. I mean, if I had it my way, I would be 100% self-sufficient. You know, yes, I would be able to help other people in my life. You know, I like being helpful to others, but I would never be the person that needed help. And indeed, needing help is one of my worst nightmares. But God has placed me in many situations where I needed to humble myself and acknowledge my limitations and maybe you are like me maybe asking for help is the last thing you would ever want to do but i have news for you if that is you god made it clear 
that we are not designed to work that way. A part of being human is not just being helpful to others, but also receiving help. You know, and in coming back to this passage, we can imagine that the widow in this passage, her husband probably helped many people because, you know, of the circle that he ran in being around prophets and their children. And sometimes when we get accustomed to helping others, we don't like to receive help ourselves because we feel we have a reputation to uphold. But the widow in this passage knew better and we should follow her example. This brings me to my second point. So the first point is we cannot be ashamed to ask for help. The second point is this, our solution can be connected to our faith. Again, our solution can be connected to our faith. So what was the solution that the prophet Elisha gave to this widow? It seemed pretty simple at first glance, but I'm going to recap it. In general, he tells the widow to borrow large vessels from her neighbors, you know, not to just gather a few, but to borrow a lot of them and bring them in her house. And then when she and her husband, I mean, her son get back, you know, with all the vessels there to close the door. And then she is to pour oil from the jar, which was the only thing that she had in her house, the jar of oil that she had, she is to pour that oil into the vessels. And then she is to set aside what is full when she does this. So this is where the widow's faith had to come in. And as I'm saying that our solution can be connected to our faith. Um, God made it possible for her to fill every vessel that she had in her house, every one she borrowed. Thus, she was able to spread the small bit of oil that she knew she had when Elisha asked her what she had in her house. She was able to spread that oil as far as the number of vessels that she and her sons were able to gather. Do you all get that? I'm just going to break it down once, once again. If she had only gathered two or three vessels from her neighbors, that would have been the full extent of the oil that she had. But when she heard what Elisha said to her, you know, it's particularly the part about do not gather just a few, she gathered as many as she could. And what can we learn from this? Sometimes the solution to our situation is connected to our faith. The widow and her children went all out when it came to gathering the vessels because they believed what the prophet Elisha said about how God would work things out for them. Many of us would have struggled even asking Elisha for help in the first place, let alone borrowing vessels from our neighbors. Again, I can make fun of myself here. I would gladly have allowed one of my neighbors to you know, borrow from my collection of large vessels if I had them. But it would have been a struggle for me to say, hey, can I borrow? Like, I see you have 10 big vessels over here. Can I borrow them? That would have been difficult for me to do that. And again, I get it. And I'm working through it, you know, in therapy with my therapist who knows he has his hands full. But I digress here again. I will say this. Some of us haven't seen our situations turn around because we haven't had the faith to take the bold and uncomfortable steps toward a solution. And when I say that, I am not talking about the way that preachers who talk about the prosperity gospel manipulate people into writing checks that clear out their bank account and say, oh, God is going to replenish you. Like, no, no, no. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying that sometimes our faith puts us in situations that are just uncomfortable for us. Like, there are plenty of us who would have no problem writing a check toward a situation, but yet God is like, okay. Tell this person you need their help. Like, wait, what? What do you mean? Like, you get what I'm saying? So sometimes our faith will put us in uncomfortable situations. And it might not even be just that you're the person who has trouble asking for help, like what I've geared this message toward. But you know the thing in your life that would be a struggle for you to do if God asked you to do it. That sometimes, having the faith to overcome that is what is necessary oftentimes for the solutions that God has for us. Um, and like I said, I know I'm making fun of people like me who have trouble asking for help, but the reality is that 
sometimes we have pretty good reasons for being that way. And it's not always pride. And so I wanted to spell that right now because you see that person who struggles with asking for help. They're not always being prideful. They don't always think they're better than people around them. You know, many people stop asking for help after being let down repeatedly by people close to them, people who should have been able to help them when they needed it. Um, and this doesn't even just mean a straight up refusal, though some of us have had refusals. Um, the reality is that sometimes it's the result of receiving help with strings attached to it. You know, the kind of help where the person never lets you forget that they helped you, never lets you forget that you were in need at some point. The kind of help where you feel like that person's just going to come back and try to get a favor from you later, you know. Or maybe it's that that help that you received came with a side of gossip. You know, the kind where you find out people felt entitled to talk about you and what you went through for years to come just because they helped you. The point is, some of us, and I dare say a lot of us, have trouble asking for help because of the pain we experienced the last time we asked for help. But we can't let those experiences get in the way of our ability to do what God tells us to do, even when it's uncomfortable and forces us to humble ourselves. Elisha made it clear that the woman needed to gather a lot of vessels. And in the end, God allowed her oil to spread as far as the many vessels that she was able to gather. Because the passage makes it clear, she didn't have any vessels in her house. She didn't have any empty vessels to put this oil in. Everything she was able to get in terms of the oil that um, God enabled her um, jars to fill, oh, I, mean, I mean, in terms of the jars that God enabled her oil to fill. So I'm gonna say that again, every bit of oil that God gave to this woman to fill these jars, she was only able to have it because of the amount of jars she was willing to borrow from her neighbors. So in that same way, we need to understand that our faith, or sometimes our lack of faith, can impact the solutions that God has for us when it comes to the issues that we face. So this brings me to my last point here. So in recapping, the first point is we cannot be ashamed to ask for help. The second point is that our solution can be connected to our faith. And the final point is this, miracles can be practical. And I'll say that again, miracles can be practical. And this is the part of the message that I feel is most encouraging. Because Elisha did not just have the widow accumulate oil all over her house. He told her after she did so, you know, sell what you need to sell to pay off your debt and then live off the rest of it. In other words, this was a miracle that was performed for practical reasons. The widow needed extra money, not just to keep her children out of slavery, but to live. Because as we understand, you know, it's not like there were a lot of opportunities for women to bring in money. And it wasn't clear that her children were at a point where they could take care of her. But God used Elisha to make that happen. Why is this important? It's important because sometimes we feel like our practical issues are too basic to talk to God about. So what do we do? Well, sometimes we're okay with communicating with God about the big things, you know, the people who we care about who are sick, the oppression that we see in our society, the violence that we face in our communities, the strife that exists in our families, but we might overlook the smaller practical things that we're ashamed of, you know, like maybe our personal debt. But what we can learn from this passage here is that God cares about all of these things and that the solution to those problems, the solutions will still have to potentially be miraculous. And for those of us who forget that, that miracles can be practical, let's not forget that in the New Testament, one of the first miracles that Jesus performed was turning water into wine. And that is a pretty practical miracle. I mean, you had to think about it, that they were at a wedding um, and the family hosting the wedding ran out of wine. And Mary 
knew what her son was capable of. It's like, okay, this will be bad for this family. So you're going to help them <laughs> by taking these vats of water and turning them into wine. And he did. So what I'm saying here is that sometimes we forget that the miracles that God performed or that God enabled Jesus to perform and that God enabled Elisha to perform in this context are of practical significance. They were solutions to practical issues, but we forget that sometimes. And I mean, it must have been humbling for the widow to see the great lengths that God would go to in order to address the debts that her husband owed. Um, especially since this um, widow probably did not have the means to address this debt on her own. Um, but that's just it. God wants us to understand that he still cares about us and cares about the things in our lives that we may feel are not even worth bringing up to him. He cares about the problems that we may blame ourselves for. He cares about the problems that we may have inherited from our loved ones. He cares. It says in our word, we sh it says in the word that we should cast our cares upon him because he cares for us. Indeed, all we indeed all we have to do is ask for help. So as we come to the end of this message, I want to encourage all of you who are listening. God has made it clear that there are many of us who find ourselves in situations that seem to have no solution just because we are ashamed to ask God to help us. And I am not saying that that's everybody. So it doesn't apply to you. That's fine. But for those of us who have gone through this or are going through it right now, I want to offer some encouragement. God does not think any less of us when we ask for help. God doesn't see us as a burden. God wants to help us because he loves us. So we can't let our past experiences keep us wrapped up in a struggle that God would have delivered us from already if we had only had the faith to ask. We have to be okay with asking God for help when we need it. And here's the kicker. God may connect our ability to be vulnerable with others to the help we need, just as he did in this passage with the widow. Because think about it, the widow in this passage would not have gotten the oil she needed to keep her children out of slavery and live off of for the rest of her life if she hadn't been willing to explain to her neighbors that she needed the vessels from them. But what we understand is this, that is the beauty of community. And I'm gonna end with this. If our friends won't help us when we need them, are they really our friends? If our family won't help us when we need us, are they really our, I mean, if our family won't help us when we need them, I'm gonna re say this one more time because I'm getting tongue tied, but I feel this is important. If your friends won't help you when you need them, are they really your friends? And if your family won't help you when you need them, are they really your family? And if someone will talk badly about you when you're in need, are they really worth knowing anyway? We can't let the shortcomings of others keep us from getting the help we need from the Lord. So next time we feel like we're reaching the end of our rope, we need to be bold, courageous, and ask for help. God bless all of you. Now I'm going to take a sip of tea and then we're gonna open the doors of the church, all right? So today's message was all about not being ashamed to ask for help when we need it. Um, and one of the best things that any of us can do right now is to form a personal relationship with God. Because what we see in this passage is the widow, she knew enough to understand that she needed to get God's attention, that God was the only one that could help her with what she was dealing with. And for us now, in order for us to have that same kind of relationship with God, we must first acknowledge the role that his son Jesus paid by dying on the cross for our sins. So if you would like to begin this journey as a believer 
which means that Jesus died for you, you know, and was resurrected. And that in doing so, he freed us from the hold that death would have had over us as a result of sin. Then I encourage you to pray this prayer with me right now. Say, God, I confess that Jesus is Lord, and I believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. If that is you, we would love to hear from you. We encourage you to fill out a contact card. Um, you can also put it in the comments. You can direct message us. We just would love to hear from you. We'll reach out to you. You'll hear from me or from our first lady or from our deacon. And we'll give you the next steps. We'll help with the next steps in your journey as a believer. Whether that means uniting with us as a full member, uniting with us as an affiliate member, or even if we help you find a church that can teach you and help you to grow in the ways of God close to where you are. Because as I've said, we do want to open up at some point. We will be in a building at some time, you know, in the future. But if that's you, reach out to us and you'll hear back from me or from our first lady or from our deacon. Or maybe you're somebody who already identifies as a believer, but you are looking for a church that you can belong to. A church that's passionate about breaking barriers and building bridges like we are. A church that's okay with having difficult conversations about racism, sexism, homophobia, and all other forms of oppression. A church that believes that social justice is not in addition to the gospel, but a part of the gospel based on what Jesus said in Luke 4, 18. You know, if that is what you're looking for, we would love to have you here as Pivot Point, at Pivot Point Gathering, whether you come as a full member, you know, or an affiliate member, meaning you just like what we do here, but you are a part of another church too. That's cool. We love you no matter what. And we want you to be a part of our family. You know, we would love to help you to do what God has called you to do in your life. You know, we'll partner with you. So if that's you, we also encourage you to fill out the contact card. Um, we, you can also um, leave a comment for us, direct message us, and you'll hear back from me or for our first lady or our deacon. Or maybe you're in need of prayer. Again, you can put your prayer requests in our comments today, and I will pray for them after service because, unfortunately, the comments are still not coming through. Um, or you can also submit your prayer request through your contact card or on our Instagram and Facebook story, and we will pray for you. We also love to hear when God is answering prayer. So, um, And lastly, you can also fill out the contact card if you want some more information about what we do as a ministry. You'd like to be on our mailing list. So now that we've gotten through that, I'm going to take a sip of tea, and then we're going to bless our elements of communion. So if you're ready, if you get those things together, we can move to that portion of our service. Okay, as we're moving into Holy Communion, I found my communion slides, so I'm going to put those up now so you can see. This is where we are right now. Yep, someday we'll be able to sing some communion songs while I'm getting things together, but for now, this is where we are. So, right now you can take your symbols of the body and blood of christ together like this hold them in your hands and we're going to pray for them together let us pray dear god we pray that you would bless these symbols um of the awesome price that you paid by dying for our sins and be with us now as we move into this communion service where we just focus on the important 
role that you play in our lives and in the freedom that we have because you paid it all for us. These things we ask in your son Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to put this up because this is a Bible verse that I read every every um, time we have a communion service, and it's this. This comes out of Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 through 28, and it reads thus. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. The body, sorry, body and blood of Christ. Let us all eat and drink thereof. Amen. So now, like I've said, this is usually the time when I would try to review all the prayer requests, but I cannot see them. So what we're going to do is we're going to go right back to today's service when I talked about the things we were praying about as a ministry. I'm going to put those up on the screen as we close out. And any prayer requests that were submitted, I said, I will pray for them after service. But unfortunately, I can't see them right now because, like I said, this is the first time we've had this technical difficulty where I just can't see comments at all. But I'm thankful that you all are here today. And, yeah, this has been a great service. I look forward to seeing, you know, the comments that you all have been leaving. You know, I pray this has been a great time for all of us to come together. And, yeah, I look forward to seeing you all next week, God willing. But thank you all for spending this time with us. You really don't know how much it means to get the kind of support that we get from you all as a ministry. You know, we love you all. We're thankful to be able to support you all and serve you in this capacity. We look forward to doing a lot of great things together um, as this church. So now I am going to close us out in prayer. Um, we're going to talk about these prayer requests first, and then, yeah, we will close. But thank you again. I love all of you. And, yeah, I'm really feeling, I guess, the spirit of my father in the ministry coming up. Because growing up at the church where I grew up, we used to always say, he used to always say, God loves you, and so do we. And so that's something that I really believe a lot of us need to hear. God loves you, and so do we. Because we're in a society right now where a lot of people don't even get a chance to hear, I love you every day. Like, this might be the one time you hear somebody say, I love you all week. So I love you, God loves you, we all at Pivot Point Gathering love you. And with that, I'm going to close out. So let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for the privilege coming before you once again. We thank you for the word that was preached and for the challenge you gave us to ask for help when we need it. Help us to work through the issues that may get between us asking you for the help that you can provide. You know, help us to heal, help us to forgive, and for those of us who need it, help us to have a bit more humility. And right now we pray on behalf of all the prayer requests that have been shared, those that are in our comments right now where I can't see them, those that are um, on our Instagram or Facebook stories, those that will be submitted on our Instagram or Facebook stories, those that will come into our contact cards, and those that will come in any other way. Have your way. Show yourself in our lives um, that you will get the glory out of all that we do. Um, we know that this has been a difficult time for a lot of us. Some of us have been having financial difficulties. Some of us have been sick. You know, some of us have been worried about the future. Just whatever we are going through, 
we are thankful to know that it says in your word we can cast our cares upon you because you care for us and that you can do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think. So we're coming before you, expecting you to work on our behalf, you know, believing that you can do it. So we ask for your protection, Lord. We know that some of us have been going through some major challenges, some major challenges that have no real explanation but the fact that we're just being tested. But we pray that you would protect us from those tests and that we will pass those tests, that we will be great representatives of you no matter what challenges or obstacles we face. And right now, we still pray that you would give us direction about our location, where it should be, how it should look, what features it needs, and also help us to gain the capacity we need to be the kind of church that you have called for us to be. We pray about the violence on our streets and the fact that we've had so many mass shootings even in the past few weeks. And we just pray that you would help us as a ministry figure out what we can do um, as Pivot Point Gathering to have an impact on the violence in our streets as well as what we can do to improve the health in our community. We pray for those in our community who are dealing with illnesses. We pray that the doctors will be able to help um, my little cousin Jordan, who has been going back and forth to the hospital a lot recently. And we know that there are many others in our community who are going through the same thing. And we ask you to bring about the healing that they need to grant the doctors the wisdom that they need in order to come up with a great course of treatment and also raise up the caretakers they need while they're in these trying times. We pray for our bereaved families. I mean, knowing that their loved one is with you doesn't necessarily make it easy for them to live without that loved one. So help them to know that it's okay to be sad. It's okay to miss that person because it means that they love that person and give them the support they need someone that can listen to them talk as much as they need to talk about what they're going through. And lastly, we pray about um, our political system as we are gradually, well, not gradually, but rapidly approaching this fiscal cliff. Just bring about a solution and replace many of these politicians with those who actually care about the people that they're called to serve and care about representing you to the best of their ability. And now, um, as we leave this place and go back to our respective lives, we ask that you would watch over us um, that you would continue to let your light shine through us. People come to know more about you as they interact with us. That people will be saved because they come to know about you and what you've done in our lives. And we pray for those whose prayer requests remain on their hearts right now. Um, just have them um, know that you hear them. You even hear what they're afraid to say and that you can work it out for them. And we ask a special blessing on my cousin, Matt, and his wife, Arequa, um, as they now have begun um, this new season. And we pray that you'll also be with them as they continue planning for um, their traditional ceremony in a few weeks. And now, may the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with us now, henceforth and forevermore. Amen. God bless you all, and God willing, we will see you next week for Mother's Day. And I put up the wrong prompt. God bless you.